Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today I've got a Sunday episode for you that is a bit different, but I think it can be very helpful regardless of where you are. Maybe you're doubting for the first time. Maybe you're in the middle of a deconstruction. Maybe you have already deconverted or maybe you have been a lifelong atheist. Either way, I think we can learn something here. And what I have for you is a message from a patron. First of all, thank you so much for your patronage. I really appreciate the channel support. And when I saw your message, my heartstrings were tugged and I wanted to reply to you. And I thought that the best way I could fully articulate and answer this would be to make a video response. Now, we're keeping this person anonymous because I have not yet heard back from them on if I could use their name. But for the sake of the rest of this video, let's call this person A. And A is having some doubts and wants to talk about the legitimacy of personal testimony. This message that A sent me is not too long, but we are going to break it down in parts so we can be really, really honed in on what we're talking about. The first lines here are, I received a text from an online friend, a Christian, who told me that the Lord had put me on his mind. Now there's more coming after this, but let's start here. And let's start with the very first sentence. A's friend sent them a text saying, the Lord put you on my mind. How very vague. Now, there's many different ways we could conceive of this. We could see it as simply coincidence. We could see it as maybe this friend knows about A's deconstruction. I don't have all the information. If they did, it could be a form of manipulation to keep them in the faith. Or even giving a better benefit of the doubt, maybe this person really did have A come into their mind, and in the interpretation of their biblical religious lens, they believe that that message came from God and are just doing their due diligence to pass the message along. But I want to examine this, and it doesn't really matter which angle it comes from. Let's really think about this for a second. The first question I would pose to A is, why the middleman? If I knew that my son was doubting that I loved him, he can't doubt my existence because unlike God, I actually show up with him all of the time. So we're using a different example. Let's say he's doubting that I love him. Him. The first and immediate thing I would do is go talk to my son directly. I would explain that I do love him. I would try to help him understand the ways I've shown him love, give him evidence of this love so he can feel assured. What I would not do is tell my daughter to go tell my son that I loved him. And that's even more than we're getting from this initial message. There is no message to this person, just, hey, you were on my mind, God put you there. If I, as a mere fallible human mortal, can see that one of these two paths, middleman or direct, is definitely more beneficial at the desired outcome of giving my son this assurance, why can't the all-powerful, all-knowing God of the universe? In what way is it actually better for this person? And I don't have his whole backstory, but let's assume he's been a Christian here for a good number of years. He worships, loves, and obeys this God. He's now going through a deconstruction process. In what way is the best call for God a vague message from someone else? A Christian might say, well, first of all, God works in mysterious ways. Cop out. Really, let's talk about why this could be better. Well, Okay, if you're going to press me on it, maybe because God can influence two people's lives. He can build the faith of the friend and also encourage the individual. That's a pretty good answer, except again, it's less beneficial to the individual. It seems like the friend doesn't have a problem with their faith. Why risk the eternal soul of a, just to try to kill two birds with one stone. Well, maybe he needs A to learn to take things more on faith. So we're not going to give him all of the evidence. We're not going to get him all the way there. But the issue is already a crisis of faith. How does being vague and utilizing another person help someone with their faith? It's obviously just causing more confusion. And does God need to make these efficient optimizations where he only has a limited amount of time, so he has to do something that can help potentially two people instead of something that can definitely help one? How insulting is it to believe that this God is up there and that you are struggling and that he is clear as day talking to your friend about you while ignoring you completely. I see this as beyond obvious and ineffective and clearly only causing more confusion. Now, from the friend's perspective, I think, again, trying to be kind, there's two situations. Either they know their friend is having doubts, and that's maybe why it came into their mind in the first place, and then they attributed that meaning to God, or they don't know that their friend is having doubts, in which case this is just a great coincidence. But neither one proves anything particular about the truth claim of this God. This is confirmation bias, and the availability heuristic at full display. How many other times has someone popped into your mind that you don't attribute to God? Oh, but now it's your friend that you know is going through a deconstruction, so this is clearly from God. But when you had a random memory last night of a particular conversation you had with someone in high school, that was just, what, 
memory, if you really took note of how many different people or situations or events you think about seemingly randomly, you might be able to better understand how non-special it is that this person's name came into their mind. We are at the whim of what our brains put in front of us constantly, and it is a barrage. For any of you that can remember back to the first time you practiced mindfulness meditation, and maybe you were told something like, try not to think about anything, or try to focus on the exhale of your breath, or focus on the rise and fall of your stomach. And yet, as you did this, thought after thought after thought after thought seemingly came at you out of nowhere. The fact that sometimes some of those thoughts are going to line up to events that are happening in our life that make maybe more sense or a better connection does not prove God does not indicate that the thought is coming from God. And once again, it's this simple. If God is so willing to interfere into the free will of human thought to put someone in particular on someone else's mind, why not just help A out directly? There's simply no good excuse for this. Let's move on to the next line. And I promise we won't be this thorough for each and every single line in the message. But A says, now, since I am actively deconstructing, my first instinct was to believe that this was a sign from God, that I'm making a mistake. Maybe it was. I honestly don't know. This is so fair and so honest. And I thank you, A, for sharing so humbly. The deconstruction process is one of true confusion. You are torn between two worlds. This thing that has been claimed perfect truth your entire life. A God who works through signs and interpreters and anecdotal experience and all of these other highly emotional feelings in lieu of actual empirical evidence, this very vague spiritualism mixed with what you're deconstructing, you're trying to understand, is this real? Do I have a good basis to believe this kind of a thing? Is there validity in the scriptures? Do these experiences mean what I have previously perceived them to mean? And you might go a few weeks or a few days or a few months or even a few years in your deconstruction or your deconversion and feel really confident about something. And yeah, that's obvious nonsense and that doesn't make any sense. And then bam, just like that, a friend says, God put you on my mind. Whew, emotional right? It's feeling. It's personal. Whoa, is God thinking about me? Is God reaching out for me? This isn't some internet stranger. This is someone I consider to be a friend, someone I trust. They wouldn't lie. They're not manipulating me. They must really believe this. And if they really believe this, maybe it's true. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm deceived. Oh no. And the worry and the fear, and again, always the confusion so easily creep in. The first thing I would point out, and I don't know A at all. I don't know their path. I don't know how far into their deconstruction they are. I don't know what kind of a Christian they were or their background. But one thing I know to be very true across the board is that many people deconvert. I don't want to say for bad reason, but maybe with bad evidence. If you deconstruct or deconvert off of feeling, then other feelings are going to flip you back in. And yes, it's justifiable to be hurt by the church, and to even have the thought that something this true and this good and this loving shouldn't lead to this many negative consequences. That's a fair thought. It doesn't immediately eradicate this God. It doesn't make you right and him wrong. It doesn't mean he doesn't exist. And so if that's your entire basis, it's also going to make you much more susceptible to the flip-flop confusion nature as other feelings get brought in against your prior feelings. In a game of feelings, no one wins, which is why I like facts. And the fact of the matter is, and what I would encourage A to do here, is instead of going back and forth between feelings, again, not saying that's all he's doing, have you considered why you really don't view the Bible as a source of truth? Have you looked at the origin stories of Yahweh to see what a man-made creation he has been and how it has changed through time, which is something that an immutable God as described in Malachi, should not do. Have you seen the mutually exclusive properties of this God actually on display when you read the text? Do you understand the contradictions and the context of the Bible? Do you have a good understanding of time and place and other cultures and other religions to know that at the end of the day, this is nothing special? Have you looked into the psychology and the cognitive biases at play with why you believe and why you were raised to believe this and how you might be defending or doubting a different God right now if just simply born at a different time or place. There are many other good additional reasons to doubt this God and deconstruct and eventually deconvert than from feeling. 
And as you get more and more and more of that solid foundation of why this God is no different than Allah or Zeus, when someone shares a personal testimony with you, it's going to affect you no differently than if a Muslim shared a personal testimony with you, right? I would question you, A, go back to whenever you weren't deconstructing. And if someone from Scientology came up to you and said, listen, Lord Zenu put you on my heart, how seriously would you take it? If someone from a Hindu background came up to you and said, hey, Lord Vishnu put you on my mind, would you have the same level of concern or doubt that you had missed the boat, that you were being deceived? Or would you, because you simply did not have any emotional investment ever into that particular religion, have brushed it off like the nonsense that it was? If you can't brush off Yahweh, it's not because he's somehow more true. It's because that's been your background. That's what's deep, deep down in your psyche. And I'd also encourage you to look at how much of this is coming from a place of either confusion and chaos or fear. That feels very human. So to wrap this part up, you already nailed it. You said your first instinct was to doubt yourself to be worried, to be afraid that you were making a mistake or deceived. How very telling that initial reaction that is coming completely from deep down in your subconscious where the fear of God was instilled long ago is acting out. It makes perfect sense, but it does not point to the truth of God. Let's read a little bit further. He says, anyways, I admitted to him that I was having doubts and he shared his personal testimony with me. It was the classic story of being lost and then being guided by the Lord and being able to see his hand when looking back on his life. I was compelled by his story, but I also understand that oftentimes there is an element of distortion when one retells a story. So because of this, you open more up to him sharing your actual doubts in more detail and then he tells you his personal story. Now, did his personal story contain all of the empirical evidence for God? Did it show how we can know the Bible is 100% accurate, inerrant, and true? Did it show you the differences in the claims of Yahweh versus the claims of other gods of the past? Was it then instead anecdotal evidence of someone's own bias and personal recalling of hindsight looking back and making connections and mappings that, well, that must have been God's hand? Two things. One, you could do this with anything, I promise you. And two, Everyone who has ever believed in a God is able to do the same thing with their life. That should take some of the zip out of this for you. Your friend has their own filter, a Yahweh filter, a Christianity filter, and that is how they are looking through at the memories of their life. They want to see God there, and guess what? They do, but not clearly. They never sat across from this God and had a conversation. They believe through prayer that they've had conversations and that the voices in their head are telling them something back that happens to be lined up with scripture and is from God. But you've had that, surely, as a Christian. You just are starting to doubt if that's real when your friend is still convinced that it is. I'm going to give you a bad analogy off the top of my head here. If you and your friend were both raised as white supremacists and you started waking up thinking like, man, I don't know if this is right. Like, it doesn't all add up. You know, other people of other colors seem to be just as human as me. They seem to have just as much value as I have. They seem to be just as capable as I am. You're doubting this and you talk to your other friend who was raised the same way and they tell you, no, listen, look, here's how I can prove it. Here's how I know. And there's no empirical evidence of these differences or why whites should be honored higher, why they're some master race. There's anecdotal experience tied into the structure of belief with which you were indoctrinated into, right? Even if it's just something as basic as, well, look at us. We're thriving. We're doing great. And there's an example over there of a person of color who is not doing great. So see, it matches up with what we've always been taught, that we are better and deserve better. I can see the great hand of white supremacy at play in my memories as I look back. Through the worst filter, with horrible evidence, not taking outside factors and variables into consideration to arrive at this conclusion they already wanted to arrive at. That's all the personal testimony is of any kind, for any ideology, for any belief, for any religion, for any cultural conception, it is that simple. Personal testimony is personal. It's on a measure of one. It's not data. It's not truth. It's truly almost the antithesis of these things. And it can only be useful for that individual. And by useful, I mean believable to them. Most of the time, it's probably doing them a disservice. But to extend their personal testimony to mean something for you, where is your personal testimony? If this God is real and works in personal ways in people's lives to convince them of something, 
he should be doing it for you. And if he's not, and you have to rely on someone else's, that's not your fault. Despite the fact that these people will tell you, oh, it's your sin getting in the way. Oh, it's your own doubt getting in the way. If you would just do this or this or this or this, you would hear God like I do. Wrong. The other thing that I think would be interesting to ask your friend about would be, what if you had another friend who had personal testimony of Allah? Or what if you had another friend who had personal testimony of believing that Jesus was real and then finding out very clearly that he was not and being able to look back at his life and see the truth of atheism in it the whole time? What would your friend say about that personal testimony? He would say it's null and void because person one is worshiping a false and wrong God and person two is deceiving themselves. Ah, so the only testimony for personal belief that we should take seriously is the one that matches up with his version of the truth and his own bias. It's a hypothetical and I'm speaking for them, but I would assume that's what you would hear. And then I am hoping you can see how simple and ridiculous that concept becomes. Let's move on to the next thing that A said. He also believes that God burdened him with me so that I wouldn't go down a bad path. I can't help but worry that he is right and I am making a huge mistake. There is so much in me that says, keep going, but it's hard to listen to when another part of me wonders if I'm being deceived somehow. Isn't it funny? And maybe A put these words in his friend's mouth, maybe not, but that God has burdened him. It's always a negative connotation. Listen, I'm worried about you, okay? This is this is hard for me too, as your friend, to see you do this, to see you mess up your life, to see you be so clearly deceived. And God's tugging on my heart. He's not leaving me alone. He wants me to help you because if you leave God, you're going to go down this wrong path. How ridiculous. And I'm projecting here from some of my own conversations with my own friends, but how dismissive of who you are as a person that the second you would leave the same belief system your friend has, you would become something worse. And of course they believe that. It's what their scripture tells them to believe. Christians do not have a monopoly on morals or doing good. And throwing that in your face as some kind of a fear tactic of who you will become is downright disingenuous. And then we're back to your dichotomous parts. Your one part that is seeking truth, trying to make sure that you're not erred already making sure that the wool hasn't been pulled over your eyes. And yet it's battling these other voices saying, this is how you become deceived. This is how you stray. By what? Seeking truth? So what should you be doing, according to your friend, to not be deceived? Deceive yourself? Go against how you're currently thinking and feeling? Not desire for answers to the hard questions of specific religions and their claims? I think we could have a whole conversation. I know we could have a whole conversation on this concept of being deceived, and I'd encourage you, if you haven't, to watch this video. According to the verses that I quote in that video and all of the examples that I give that are all biblical, no one has any ability to actually be assured of their faith. Anyone at any time while still on this earthly realm can be deceived by the devil, by his demons, or by God himself. There can be people that think they're saved that will supposedly wake up upon their death to find that they are not. Even the elect is what the Bible says, which is an insane statement. So again, if you want a further discussion about if you should worry about if you're deceived or not, watch that video. But if your friend believes you can be deceived, then by the own definition of deception, it's not your fault. And how would you know? So if you, in all of your clear, sane presence of mind, are thinking, I don't want to be deceived, I want the truth, and I'm willing to tackle the hard questions and follow the truth wherever it goes, that, to me, sounds like the opposite of deception. That sounds like someone being honest. Next, and almost done, he says, I've wanted to look into personal testimony from other religions and see how that differs from Christian testimony. I'm not in an emotional place right now to claim that all these redemption stories are not based in a true belief system, but I think I could get there if they happen in other religions and beliefs as well. This is so true, and this is such a problem. So many times, especially, I'll just speak from personal experience in America, we are told in our Christianity, this is the only truth. And under that guise, that there is only one God and it's this God, and you happen to have got it right, luckily, by being born in the time and place that you were, when you feel those emotional and typical human psychological, even spiritual feelings, you attribute them to the God that you know and believe in, and you believe that those feelings are special and unique. Because if those feelings can only come from a God, and you happen to have the only right God, then you and other Christians like like you are the only ones that get to have those experiences and you're dead wrong. Go speak to other people of 
any other religion that really believe what they believe. And they will share personal testimony, divine revelation, how their God or gods worked with them in dreams to reveal themselves or to give them a message, how prophecy was utilized, how healing happened. All of the things that you think are special and unique to the Christian experience, the feeling of the Holy Spirit that you know so surely is the Holy Spirit, they feel with their particular God. And it took me a long time to actually be able to recognize and believe that, but it's just being human. We know that humans can have these deep spiritual experiences as a natural phenomenon. And what every one of those humans does is attribute those feelings as evidence for their particular God belief. And that's why personal experience is one of the hardest things to get over as you start to deconstruct and deconvert. But you're right, as soon as you really come to the correct understanding that it is something everyone is capable of having and experiencing, and that everyone of all different walks of faith does, it eradicates this idea. So my encouragement to you and to other people that are hung up on the same step, have real conversations with real people who believe really different things than you. And I promise you, you will see very quickly how human we all are and how natural, not supernatural, this all is. I hope a, to you, that this has been helpful. And I hope to anyone else watching that you've gotten some further insight into the turmoil and the chaos and the doubts and the process of deconstruction and deconversion. Even if you're a Christian who's never going to change their mind, maybe you can understand some of the earnestness of the seeking and searching of the individual who's going through deconstruction or who has arrived at the other side already of deconversion. They're not trying to personally offend you. They are simply on their own journey looking for truth and struggling with what has always been claimed as truth in their life when some kind of evidence pops up against it. That is a very hard thing to go through and I think that everyone, no matter where people end up or what process they're deconverting or deconstructing from or going towards, should have a little bit more empathy and grace for. So that's all I have to say on the subject. I hope that this kind of a video was fun, entertaining, educational, and helpful. Please let me know any comments you have. And until next time, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank all of my top tiers of support. My Iconoclist, Anne, Boris, GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean. My Humanist Heroes, Jared and Christy. My Atheist Advocates, Caleb, Imposter, Jeff, Jeffrey, Karen, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my Secular Scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine people.